Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name's Jerry Ryder, and I work with the um, skilled workforce team in the ARDC, and I'm based at Wake Campus in Adelaide. Now, um, I'll introduce our guest presenters shortly. Uh, I just wanted to start though with a little bit of background because I know some of you will be aware of the counter code of practice for usage data associated with library resources such as databases, electronic journals and e-books. But today we're going to hear about the counter code of practice for research data and the five steps needed to implement that, that code in your repository. As you know, the ARDC has a strong interest in citation and usage metrics for research data and has been involved in a number of global initiatives aimed at implementing and improving processes around this. We're currently in discussions with the Make Data Count project team about how the ARDC can support those Australian institutions wishing to implement MDC, uh, the Make Data Count uh, protocol for their data repositories. So please watch this space and please do let us know if you have an interest in pursuing this further. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, let's get on with our presentation today where we're fortunate to have two fabulous guest presenters. First up, we have Patricia Cruz, who's currently Executive Director of DataSite, um, uh, where her role is to advance DataSite's mission, build partnerships and work with uh, stakeholders. Prior to joining DataSite, Tricia was Director of the University of California Curation Centre at the California Digital Library. Tricia is a strong advocate for data sharing and we're delighted that she could join us today. After Patricia, we will hear from Daniela Lowenberg, whose current role is as Research Data Specialist and Data Publishing Product Manager at the California Digital Library where she has played a lead role in the Make Data Count project. Uh, prior to joining the California Digital Library, Daniela spent uh, three years as a publications manager at PLOS One, where she implemented and oversaw the PLOS data policy, as well as running some journal operations. And we are also delighted to have Daniela with us today. Okay, so thank you everybody for um, joining this webinar and um, hopefully we can get some good questions out of it. And um, thank you to both Jerry and Susanna for setting this up. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about the Make Data Count project, um, kind of some of the background and the logistics associated with it. Um, and then um, just really what the initiative is about and uh, what some of the milestones were in 2018 in the first release. Um, and this will kind of give you an idea of, of what our vision for Make Data Count is and, and how um, you can use it in your repository. So first, what is Make Data Count? And cool people call it MDC, um, or you can call it Make Data Count. And when we really started with Make Data Count, um, we really um, wanted to imagine a world where data are considered a first class research output and are valued as such. You know, that there would be birds singing and bunnies hopping around and, and little squirrels and everybody was really thinking that data is just as valuable as journal articles. And between 2014 and 2015, when I was at the California Digital Library and Daniela was at PLOTS, um, we uh, did a, a project funded by the National Science Foundation. And when, in that project, um, it was really to think about what it was we needed to do in order to collect usage metrics around data, thinking about how you count um, usage metrics. What, what do researchers want um, when you count usage metrics? What's important to them? Um, and this came out, um, I'm showing a, an article here from John Kratz and Carly Strasser that um, had a publication in Scientific Data that came out of that award. And part of that was doing this extensive survey where we asked researchers um, what was important to them. And we, um, both researchers and data managers uh, measure scholarly prestige in citations of researchers and 61% of data managers rank citations as the most interesting metric. And so that's where we really focused our attention 
um, in the Making Data Count project. Let's go forward a little bit. Um, and in, in DataSite, Data One, the California Digital Library Counter, we're funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to really take the work that we did that's part, what was part of that original project um, and to think about, okay, let's, you've done all the thinking about it, you've talked to a lot of people, understand what's important, okay, how do we implement it? And so that is what the Make Data Count um, project is all about. It's really about making real a lot of the work, prior work that we did. And there's, um, here's the basic um, things that are part of the Make Data Count project. Um, we're 18 months into this project, actually a little bit longer. Um, and the first thing was a formal recommendation for measure, measuring usage data. And that's where the counter code of practice comes in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the second thing is to develop a hub for data level metrics so people can um, collect metrics um, around and reuse those metrics um, around their repositories. And the really the overall goal is to make um, tracking that usage much easier and much easier for people to do and therefore driving adoption and showing how easily it can be done. And that's one of the things we're doing with you today and, is, and engaging across all the research communities. It's not specific to any one research community, but any research community can use this. So the Make Data Count project, this is just a, a nice uh, little image that shows you all the different pieces of it. Um, where we're leveraging existing initiatives um, that are out there, such as data citations, um, and developing a new recommendation, such as the counter code of practice. Um, and those feed into um, a data level metrics hub that is hosted by the by DataCite. Um, and this is where, if you participate in this, you push your server um, logs into be processed in the data metrics hub. Um, and then we drive a gate engagement um, across all the communities and using the data, um, the data level metrics hub, you're able to, to display data metrics. And when Daniela goes into her presentation, I think this will be a little bit clearer, but this is really a schematic of how all the pieces kind of fit together. So, so far, um, talking about the counter code of practice, um, we have, uh, created a data usage metric standard, and this is on um, the counter website, and it um, the counter code of practice really talks you through um, how data usage should be measured. And um, if you think about a journal article, a PDF file, it's pretty easy to think, okay, um, one person downloaded that um, journal article um, and the metadata was viewed X amount of times. With research data, it gets more and more complicated, as you can imagine. Um, as people, uh, what do you count? You count when people view uh, a piece of metadata. You count when a, a data set is downloaded. Do you count also the prior data set if it has a related data set that it was also downloaded? What about versions of data sets? Um, and uh, so that's what the counter code of practice really digs into that. Then we socialize that counter code of practice um, and developed a data usage metrics working group um, that's run by uh, um, the, at the Research Data Alliance. Um, we also have reached out at many, many conferences and talked to many people um, about the counter code of practice and, and what it means and, and how to put it into practice. We gave um, the MDC a narrative and you saw the little unicorn earlier and we're bringing it back for a second time just because we love it so much. Um, this is Daniela um, Martin Fenner and myself. We're presenting at the um, Pitapalooza, which took place in Girona last year. Um, and it's really, um, we, we tried to really, um, uh, as, I, as the slide says, is give it a narrative and make sure that people understand why it's so important to engage in this initiative. At DataCite, we built a hub for open metric for an open hub for usage metrics, and um, this is available to anybody through our API. Um, and so you can grab those usage metrics via the API. The second, the other thing that we did is we implemented at our own repositories, and this is really Data One and and um, Daniela at um, using Dash and um, soon Dryad, um, where we looked at uh, you know let's 
give this a test run. We, we found that when we would talk about this project and we would talk about um, how usage data metrics and what it needs to look like, um, we really needed to put a picture with it. And so we um, felt it was really important to, to show how it's done and show what the value of, is it, of um, showing usage data metrics are. And then the um, really important thing, and this is something that I'm particularly excited about, is adding data citations to the mix. So um, if a, a data um, is used, that's great. Um, but if the a data is cited, um, we can also track that and include that. And Daniela will talk a little bit more about that as, as she goes forward. But it's really um, trying to get that publishing community um, to move forward um, to cite data um, in, in research articles, et cetera, so that we can also track that as an output. All of this together with um, making data a first-class citizen. So Daniela, I think this is over to you now. Sorry, so what does it all look like? Uh, thanks, Tricia, for talking about what we've been working on. Um, as she mentioned, we implemented at our repositories. Um, I myself uh, am at California Digital Library, and we have our own data repository called Dash, which you may have also heard about is becoming Dryad. Um, and then the Data One repository is implemented as well. And so you can see here on the right that we have the metrics. Uh, the views, the downloads, and the citations. Uh, and of course, you know, the views and downloads standardization is happening in the back, and I'm going to walk through this after. Um, but the big part then is that you can click on the citations and you can actually see the real time citations uh, that are related to this, this data set. Um, and we can see it in data one as well. Here um, we can see the views and the downloads and the citations as well. And when you click on the citations there, you can see the full list as well. Um, and so that's the high level of what this actually looks like at a repository level, but we're gonna go back some steps and walk through the implementation. But first I wanted to address, I think a lot of people um, are probably wondering how this relates to other initiatives. And one that uh, folks at ARDC have been involved in for a long time is Scholix. Um, Scholix is not a thing, is what we like to say. We work very closely with Scholix. Most of DataCite is Scholix, um, but it's a change initiative. And so the Make Data Count and Scholix teams work really closely to advocate for best data citation practices. Um, but how we really work together is that Scholix is an information framework. So it actually is explaining how people can submit their data citations properly to Crossref. And Make Data Count on the other side is actually giving an infrastructure for just for displaying those data citations back at the repository level. So if you have questions about that, we can talk about those at the end. Um, but I wanted to move on to implementation at your repository. What does this all actually look like? And we'll get into the details here. Um, why is it so important that we do this? Uh, we need a way to be able to measure data. And we know a lot of people, oops. <laughs> we know a lot of people right now are talking about <laughs> there we go. Oh, okay. People are talking about uh, how data needs to be valued and we need to be able to credit data and how important that is. But we can't do any of that until people have actually implemented a framework for standardized data metrics and for showing data citations. Um, and so what we really care about is building this out so that repositories and publishers are supporting make data count practices so that researchers and repositories and funders and publishers and all of us that support researchers can actually have the means to be able to evaluate the impact of data. But to be able to do that, we first need to have these standards implemented. And right now, that's not something that we have. So we put together these five simple steps for how you can make your data count. Um, of course, these are different if you're at a repository that's part of a larger repository organization or if it's a homegrown. Um, all of these steps kind of vary, but we're going to walk through at a really high level what these steps look like. And then if you are at a repository um, and you would like to talk about this further, we'd love to set up time between our uh, data site developers and your team to actually walk through the process of this. And we can go over documentation from repositories such as Zenodo and Dataverse that have or are implementing this right now. 
So the first is we built a, a getting started guide and this is on our GitHub. Um, all of these links are available from our makedataCount.org website. Um, and that, uh, that there is the starting point that walks you through what I'm gonna go through now. So the first is the code of practice for research data. And Tricia mentioned this earlier. Um, I know many of you are familiar with Counter because uh, you're at institutions and you're using this for other scholarly outputs. So we wrote a counter code of practice for research data um, with counter that they recently formally endorsed. So now it's their first code of practice, not related to articles, but related to data. Um, and it's on their website. So you can see in the screenshot, there's a link to the peer, uh, to the preprint, but on our website and other places now, we do point to counter's website as they'd like to collect all of their feedback there. Um, but we knew that this was the starting point is we actually need a standard for usage metrics. Um, and so that was the first piece of this. So um, we strongly urge anyone interested in this to read this code of practice first, or at least the executive summary. <laughs> um, so what does it actually look like at the repository level? So what it comes down to is processing the logs. So there's access logs at a repository level of people that are looking and downloading and using the data sets there. Um, and so we needed to process those against the code of practice. And that means specifically we're looking at the views and the downloads, um, which in counter language are investigations, our views and the requests are downloads. Um, and so we wanted to standardize what those things were. Um, something different with data that we also had to look at was that the uh, access methods for data are different. And so um, we had to include uh, API access in there and then also looking at automated agents like Python um, and other things that are not necessarily crawlers that we would want to exclude, but are actually robotic methods of getting the data that are common practice for researchers. So we were looking at users at the country level so that we don't have any privacy issues. And we were looking at session times as well. So if um, you click on to download a data set 100 times in 30 seconds, is that 100 downloads or one? And so that, these are the kinds of things that we defined in the code of practice that we then had to standardize within our own logs. So what we see here is this is a, screenshot of at Dash when we're calculating the stats. And so we are calculating these stats every day. And so what we're doing is we're running a Python processor that's open source and available for anyone else to use as well. And that's processing our logs against that code of practice. And what it's looking for is any new usage events that have happened since the last time we ran it. So each day, any views or downloads that are happening and then excluding those bots again uh, for any DOI that was accessed that day. Um, and then here it's put into a sushi format, which you may also be familiar with from other counter work. Um, but you can see here on the left, the body of it, what we're sending, you can see um, what country someone's accessing it from. We can see that if it's a request, that means it's a download investigation or uh, request, yeah, download and investigation is a view. So you can see the counts there. And then on the right, you can see the report. So we put in dash, which is the name of the repository. Um, and then we put in the time that we're actually filtering by. And this was the information that it's, is being sent out. Um, and that's our way of standardizing it. And all of this information, the report format, the processor we've used, um, or how we did process it in case you would not want to use a Python processor, are all available um, in our getting started how-to guide, um, but also are things that we would love to walk through with you and your developers if your institution or repository would like to get involved in this. So we've mentioned a couple times the Usage Metrics Hub, um, and this is hosted by Datasite. And it's really important because if we actually want to be able to do aggregations of this data, it needs to be in a central place. And so Datasite built this out. Uh, and, and what happens is we actually send that report that I showed the screenshot of over to the Usage Metrics Hub. Um, and that's sent in through an API right now. But if you wanted to do it manually through a CSV, that's also something that we could work with. Um, and the benefit of doing this is one, that other people can then access these usage metrics, 
um, but also that Datasite can do aggregation services. So um, right now, Datasite folks are working on doing aggregations by user, by using an ORCID. Uh, when we have an organizational identifier, we can look at by institution, by funder, anything with a persistent identifier. So it would not just be by repository, but you could really get a better sense of the usage that's happening with your research data. Um, and so these are broken down by data set and, uh, by data set and then they're aggregated over time. Um, and they're also combined with the data citations metadata. So round tripping this information, we've standardized and now we're sending it to the hub. What's important then for a repository is pulling that information back. And so a big piece of this um, is that we are making API calls to that hub for each DOI for, from the repository. And so what that means is Datasite is actually working with cross-ref event data to get all the citations from that data set. That's where Scholix and all of our working together comes in. And then what we are able to pull back then is all events related to that DOI, such as data citation from event data, and then also pulling back that usage metrics, but we could also use that from our own database, or we could pull back the aggregation. And that's kind of the round trip of the sending and receiving metrics. And what that results in is the slide earlier that we showed where you can actually see standardized views, downloads, and citations, not, not only count of citations, but what those citations actually are. And so um, it's a little less exciting to see the numbers for views and downloads because we know that repositories are already doing this a lot. But the big thing is actually having standardized metrics will allow for us to have a comparison. And right now, when we're looking at the views and downloads at data sets at repositories, we're really comparing apples and oranges because we just don't know the different ways that we're all doing that. And so the big push for us is to get as many repositories as possible to start doing that for usage metrics, standardizing them, um, along with our big push for publishers to be submitting data citations so that we can have this cycle really running. So what's next? Um, as we said a couple of times now, the biggest priority for us is outreach and adoption. Um, so it's really important to us that as many repositories as possible are able to implement this and we want to devote resources to helping repositories do this. And then the other side of it is mass outreach to publishers and we've been doing a lot of work with Scholix on this. Um, getting publishers to understand the need for them to submit their data citations properly to Crossref so that we can actually pull it back and show researchers what's happening with their data set. Um, and right now we are having a struggle with publishers doing that correctly. So you may see if you go to our website, a lot of blog posts that we've been writing about that. Um, and then we want to iterate on our implementation. So we released all of this in June of this year, uh, but we want to continue to build out what those metrics are. So Datasite, as I mentioned, is working on aggregation. Um, and then we also want to work on uh, showing different types of things, data downloads by volume, data downloads by regions, um, and then of course alt metrics that people are interested in that we could pull back, um, really anything that goes into Crossref that could be Wikipedia stuff, Twitter stuff, that kind of stuff we would be allowed to show. Um, so we're building out the functionality for that. Um, and then in the future as well, we do need to think about beyond the DOI because right now, um, if it was not clear, this is for data site DOIs um, that we are submitting um, and pulling information back from. Um, and we know a lot of research data are not just DOIs, they have accession numbers and handles. And so this is on our radar and a thing that we care about as well. Um, and with that, I think, we would love to talk about questions. And here's the uh, URL for our website. All information is linked from there, including recordings and presentations and our roadmap and our Twitter as well. Well, thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Tricia. Um, I have a question that might, uh, I guess, see a bit of further discussion. I was going to ask about DOIs being a prerequisite uh, then you mentioned that that's something that you're looking at as a next step, Daniela. So for those repositories that are not yet routinely assigning um, data site DOIs to their data sets, what, what can they be doing now and what's a sort of a timeline for their involvement? 
Trisha, do you have any data site specific response to that? Or um, well, from data site's perspective, we're really um, focusing on DOIs simply because that's kind of our, our business at this point. And um, we're also really focusing on the data citation piece as well. Um, and that is really DO, a lot of DOI compliance. Um, so that's one of the reasons that, that we're really focusing on that is because we know people really want to know what journal articles are citing a particular data set. Um, but as we go forward, I think um, um, towards the end of this project, we're going to step back and say, what are the other identifier schemes out there that we really need to work with? And um, where, where's, is there some low hanging fruit that we can do things with? And um, then maybe develop a roadmap based on that. Um, I just wanted to add one other thing that um, as a person who used to run a repository, I think um, we were always struggling for funding. And uh, so this is a really good way to, um, if your data are being used in particular, that you can say, look how valuable this repository is. Um, here's the benefits of investing in a repository. If you can show those usage metrics and um, the journal citations associated with the data in your repository, that can be a really powerful message to people. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question that's come in. Who's interested in how to distinguish legitimate API calls from non-spider malicious stat spikes? Can you help us with that one, Daniela? Sure. That is a great question. Um, that is a lot of what we spent time working on in the Code of Practice. So you can see um, in the Code of Practice or in our GitHub, we have a list of uh, what are known spiders and crawlers that we're excluding. A lot of them are similar to the ones that are used for the um, counter code of practice release five. Um, but we have added other ones that we found as well, and we're continuing to add them. Uh, there's a lot of known. And then a lot of that is then coming down to at the repository level when you start finding things and adding that to the exclusion. Um, for instance, we know that Googlebot is something that we would want to exclude. Um, but we we did put in specific parameters there of things, you know, if it's a Python thing, that's a, that would be okay. Um, but it's uh, very well laid out in the code of practice, but I'm happy to talk about that another time too. Excellent. Uh, thanks for that, Daniela. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment, um, but as I mentioned earlier, we at the ARDC are very keen to connect with people in the repository community here in Australia who had, may have an interest in pursuing this a bit further. And uh, we can certainly facilitate uh, a connection with uh, Daniela and her team. And um, uh, we would be really interested to, to uh, I guess, um, you know, track how that works uh, and see some pilots get up and running. So if you are interested, please contact us at the ARDC and then we can sort of facilitate the next steps there. And now we do have another question when we've got time for that. So uh, uh, Janet, just looking at the schema and wondering how, how Scolix hooks in. Is that something you can help with, Daniela? Sure. So, um Scolix, of course, is, is having showing how researcher or how publishers and repositories can submit their data citations properly um, over to Crossref uh, event data and also uh, through a Scolix hub um, for open air. Um, and so what we're utilizing is just ensuring that as many data citations are properly being indexed and being sent over to Crossref, those are the ones that we can pull back. And so we're not uh, defining any new schema. We're not building out anything new for data citations. Uh, we're just leveraging what's already pushing data citations into the event data hub. And then we can pull those back and show them at the repository level and aggregate them in the data site hub. So Janet, hopefully that uh, answered your question. And, and Janet has, has indicated that you have answered the question for her. So thank you, Daniela. Um, so thank you again to Patricia. Thank you again to Daniela. Thank you all for attending. Please let us know if you would like to pursue this further. We'd love to hear from you. 
in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll say farewell for now. Thank you. Goodbye from California. Bye-bye. <laughs>